Nathaniel Rono. Hi, I'm Christine Rono. Please join us in saying, Life, Life is, is a gift for which, which we are grateful. grateful. We, we gather, gather in community, community to celebrate, celebrate the, the glory and, and the mystery of this great gift. In many cultures, autumn is the season of remembrance. This is the season of harvest, when the late afternoon light turns golden and the bounty of the earth is gathered. Even as the light wanes, it's a time of celebration and gratefulness. And yes, it's also a time to honor those who have died. When we remember our departed through a spirit of harvest, of generosity and gratitude, we truly realize the depth of our debt to others. What we remember best is often what we value most in the person. And when we mourn, we clarify both what we loved about them and what's most valuable to our broader human community. All the special gifts that person brought to life Help us discern what we need now to fortify ourselves and to hold up the light in a world that sometimes seems to be spinning into darkness. In making an altar for my parents for this service, I was reminded of my father's time during World War II. He spent the war below decks in the boiler room of a destroyer working four hours on and four hours off. He never got enough sleep. It was over 100 degrees and the sweating men stripped down to boxer shorts and sandals, lived with the constant fear of a boiler explosion or an attack by an unseen enemy. They knew that if the ship was hit, they'd be the last to know and they wouldn't make it out alive. There was a lot of uncertainty, and they didn't know when it would end. My father promised himself that if he survived the war, he'd make something of his life. And he did. He was disciplined, had a quiet but steely determination, and a lifelong aversion to war. When I remember him and what he went through, the present moment has a context. And I can borrow some of his fortitude in the face of uncertainty. I imagine you may also hold someone in your heart, someone who can expand, nourish, comfort, and sustain you during this time. Someone whose experiences are a beacon. I invite you now to carve out a receptivity for their presence, to absorb their love and their guidance, and to allow yourself to be together in this community with those we love and those who love us. Blessed be.
And he loved visiting his grandmother, not only because she was really fun to be with and because they loved to cook together, but also because she lived in a beautiful cottage right on the ocean. And he could take the train from where he lived to go visit her, and he loved to get off at a special stop and then climb down a little path over some rocks and then walk all the way along the beach to get to her house. Now this one day, he knew that his grandmother wasn't feeling really good. She was pretty sick and he was worried about her. And so he decided to go take the train, go visit her. And he got off at the special stop and he climbed down the rocks and then he started to walk all the way up to her house. When he saw a strange figure walking along the beach also, as he got closer, it was a pretty tall figure, all dressed in black, head to toe in a big long robe. He had never seen anybody dressed like that on the beach before. And when he got even closer, he could see that it was death. Had a skull face and a big hood at the top of this big black robe. And he was a little afraid when he first saw him, but death was pretty kind. And death turned to him and said, hello. And he said, hello. And he said, could you help me, young man? Death said, do you know where, and he said his grandmother's name, where her cottage is? And the boy was really confused because he didn't want his grandmother to die. And so he said, yeah, it's this house right up there, pointing two houses away on the beach, even though that wasn't really her house. Her house was even further down. And so Death said, thank you, and started walking towards that house. And he looked around and he needed to think quickly. And he saw a big nautilus shell, a big rounded spirally shell. And he grabbed it and he snuck up behind Death as Death had started to float towards this other house. And he jumped on top of Death and he squeezed him down into the shell squeezing him, squeezing him, squeezing him, and he grabbed a big bunch of seaweed and he shoved it in the hole. And he had death trapped in this huge shell and he looked around and he threw it into the ocean. And he ran towards his grandmother's house and she was waiting there and she welcomed him in and he hugged her and she smelled just right and the house smelled just right. This mixture of the very beginning of a soup on the stove with the ocean air. And he was so happy. He said, what are we cooking, Grandma? And she said, I was thinking we would make our special chicken noodle vegetable soup. But I need just a few things. Could you go into town? I need some chicken. And then also, when you get back, we can harvest some vegetables fresh out of the garden. And that sounded about just the single best possible thing in the world that he wanted to do. So he jumped on his bike, which he kept there at his grandma's house, and he rode his bike into town. And he saw there was a bit of a commotion around the butcher shop where he had to go to get the chicken. And people had gathered and they said, what do you mean we can't buy any chicken? And that didn't sound good. And he went up and the butcher said, it won't die. And they said, what are you talking about? And he said, everybody clear, clear off, clear off. And usually he didn't do this out front, but the crowd had gathered and everybody wanted to buy some chicken. And he brought out the biggest cleaver that he could and he took a chicken and he put him on the chopping block and he brought the cleaver down, succunk. And sure enough, the little chicken's head popped off, but then wiggled and wiggled and wiggled and it sucked right back onto the chicken's body. And the chicken popped up, looked around all confused and kind of smiled, even though chickens don't usually smile. And the butcher put him back down and brought the cleaver down, and it flew off the little chicken head and then sucked right back on. And the boy thought, oh no. He 
thought of death that he had squeezed into that shell and thrown into the ocean. And he had a sinking feeling. So he got out, jumped on his bike, rode back to his grandma's house, and he said, they were all out of chicken, I'm sorry. And she said, well, that happens. Can you go pick some carrots and some greens from the garden? And the boy said, sure, grandma. He was so happy to see her again, so happy to smell the smells of her house. He ran out to the garden, which he also loved. He helped her plant so many months ago. He went to go grab the carrots, and he pulled out one big, juicy-looking carrot, and he was about to put it in the basket she had given him, when all of a sudden the carrot started pulling itself back into the earth. And he let go, and it went sucked right back into the earth. And he pulled another one again and was leaning all of his weight into it and trying to get it back into the kitchen. And he made it all the way up to the stairs on their porch. And his grandmother came out and said, oh, my child, what have you done? And he let go of the carrot and it flew all the way back, landed into the ground. And he sat there on the porch and she brushed his little hair with her soft, soft hand. And he told her the whole story. And she told him to go fetch death out of the water. And he swam around, it was pretty easy to find. And he brought the Nautilus shell out and he pulled out the seaweed and in a flurry of smoke, death appeared and stretched out his long bony arms and said, oh, you are very sneaky, little boy, Death said. And he said, but I will tell you, that was a refreshing break. I haven't had an afternoon to myself in many, many years. Tell you what I'll do. I will travel elsewhere today. So you may enjoy some more time with your grandmother. And the little boy said, oh, thank you. And he went back up and he went into town with his grandmother and they bought the chickens and they bought, gathered the carrots and they made a soup and they sat on the porch and listened to the waves while they enjoyed it. And it was a beautiful, beautiful day. And death did come eventually. And his grandmother did die, but somehow he knew that that was the way of things. And he missed her so much. And he remembered her so often. And it felt good to remember her. Amen. And he cast it down, down on the green grass over the young crocuses where the dew was. He cast the garment of his flesh that was full of death. And like a sword, his spirit showed out of the cold sheath. to meet his lord and as i said his spirit looked like a clean sword and seeing him the naked trees began shivering and all the birds cried out Thank you.
They are with us. We remember them. I love this service. And every year I think of this one family and their little girl, Rowan. This is her. One morning, she just didn't wake up. She was little. They don't know how or why she died. And every year, on this day of remembrance, her big brother, her mother, her father, all brought pictures, always some little hair bows that she loved. And they would bring them forward and they would place them on the altar. It matters that we take time together to remember. To lift up these lives we celebrate today. It matters that we honor and acknowledge that grieving is not something tidy and completable. Especially now with so much changing and so much unknown. It matters that we remember them. This is from Fault Lines by Robert Walsh. When the great plates slip and the earth shivers and the flaw is seen to lie in what you trusted most, look not to more solidity, to weighty slabs of concrete poured or strength of cantilevered beam to save the fractured order Trust more the tensile strands of love that bend and stretch to hold you in the web of life that's often torn but always healing. There's your strength, the shifting plates, the rest of earth, your room, your precious life. They all proceed from love, the ground on which we walk together. Life is pretty disorienting right now. 
So much is uncertain, so much unknown. And there is this natural reaction to grasp for solidity, to clutch and to hold. But this to me is one of the great lessons in grieving. When we are blown open, when loss lands, all we have is those moments. All we have is the love which remains, the love which holds us. This is Blessing for the Brokenhearted by Jan Richardson. Let us agree for now that we will not say that the breaking makes us stronger or that it is better to have this pain than to have done without this love. Let us promise we will not tell ourselves that time will heal the wound when every day our waking opens it anew. Perhaps for now, it can be enough to simply marvel at the mystery of how a heart so broken can go on beating, as if it were made for precisely this, as if it knows that the only cure for love is more of it, as if it sees the heart's sole remedy for breaking is to love still, as if it trusts that its own persistent pulse is the rhythm of a blessing we cannot begin to fathom, but will save us nonetheless. Somehow, we persist. When grief comes, when loss bursts into our day, somehow love holds us, and slowly we find our way forward and through. Not that the process is linear. I find myself all of a sudden grieving, especially my father, who has been dead now almost 18 years. I find myself remembering him, his passion for life and feasting, his deep love for me, his unabashed, encompassing love for me. I see him in my son, Jack, when he exclaims that something is delicious, swept up in flavor and artistry, in the magic of pastrami. Like me and my father before me, I imagine the three of us traveling together. When I was little, my father and I would go on road trips often, and he could find his way back to any little diner or restaurant, anywhere the service had been warm and the food delicious. We would return to places years and years in a row, places we would go only once a year, and they would remember him. This jolly Santa Claus, his warmth, his deep curiosity, his gregarious charm. This is What the Living Do by Marie Howe. Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there. And the Drano won't work but smells dangerous and the crusty dishes have piled up waiting for the plumber I haven't called. This is the every day we spoke of. It's winter again. The sky is a deep, headstrong blue, and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping off a bag of groceries in the street, bag breaking, I've been thinking this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, I thought again and again later when buying a hairbrush, this is it. Parking, slamming the car door shut in the cold, what you called that yearning, what you finally gave up. We want spring to come and winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not to call, a letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it, but there are moments walking when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass, say the window of a corner store, and I'm gripped with a cherishing so deep for my own blowing hair, chapped face, and unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you.
Friends, we are living. We remember them. Today, especially, today and always, here in this hard time, we are living. We remember them. Amen. We remember them, in the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them, in the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them, in the opening of buds and in the warmth of summer, we remember them, in the rustling of leaves and the beauty of autumn, we remember them. In the beginning of the year, and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. For our benediction today, I have been asked to read this poem by my father, Peyton Houston. 
In it you will hear the voices of two people who love each other deeply. I like to think of it as written to my mother. But it could be a poem for any two people, talking about a time when one of them may have died before the other. It creates a mythic, mysterious landscape where two people could meet again because of the power of love. It's called Arrangements for a Meeting. Tell me, how may I recognize you there where things are hidden? She said, I will be like a pine forest on a clear afternoon. As you look out into the valleys, I will stand tall at the corner where forgetting meets memory. I will braid rivers in my hair quick with the leaping salmon, and certainly you should recognize me, even with the grave room in your eyes. Certainly, I will recognize you, even with the grave room in my eyes, if you are there like a pine forest, with a light quick on the needles, if your hair is braided with running waters and the salmon tumbling waterfalls. But I would know you by your eyes, I think, any way, anywhere. Even with the grave room clouding my sight, as I stumble out into the white dimness, I would know you by your eyes and the liquid light in them, even if you didn't stand tall, where forgetting meets memory. Blessings on all our memories of loved ones this day.